my name is Rick Robinson. I'm uh, the marketing manager at Vision Research. We make the Phantom brand of cameras and I'm at Luminance 2012. The beauty of some of these images and the creativity of some of the people who take these images is inspiring a lot of people to move more and more into um, high-speed photography and we're doing our best to make that accessible to as many people uh, as we can. Thanks so much for the opportunity. It's a lot of fun to be here today and watch the different speakers and uh, have a chance to talk to you a little bit about uh, high-speed uh, photography. My name is Rick Robinson. I come from a company called Vision Research and we market our high-speed cameras under the Phantom uh, brand. Uh, what I want to talk about is um, the undeniable appeal of high-speed imagery and um, high-speed imagery really consists of two things. One is uh, perhaps still photography, where the exposure is extraordinarily short, and, uh, and so you see a moment in time like you don't ever see it normally. Um, or shooting at extremely high rates of speed so that when it's played back at normal rates of 24 or 30 frames per second, then uh, it, it appears as slow motion. Okay, and you can see uh, behind me here, these are some shots that were done actually by a very good still photographer named Jack Long. He usually shoots these paintballs into the air and then takes still photographs of him. And a few months ago, he had an opportunity to try out one of our cameras, and we saw things that, you know, we'd never seen before. And the, he calls these the dancers, because a, uh, a blob of paint that he shoots into the air kind of morphs into a picture that looks a bit like a dancer. All this happens so fast at normal speed. Uh, you wouldn't be able to see it. So a digital high-speed camera is just a still camera, if you will, that can take pictures really fast. We shoot, shoot a, a frame in a raw format, store it to memory, and take another frame as quickly as we can. And some of our cameras uh, take a few thousand frames per second. Uh, we have one camera that can shoot 1.4 million frames per second, although at a relatively small resolution because there's a speed resolution uh, trade-off in how fast you can go. Digital high-speed imaging is used in a lot of applications, but basically one way to think about it is if anything's moving fast or anything is really small and needs to be um, magnified to look at it, its motion will also be magnified, and that's where high-speed cameras are used. Most of our business is not in entertainment businesses. It's in science, engineering, and industry to uh, develop products, study new things, you know, used in academia, etc. One way of thinking about what high-speed imaging is is a, is a story that uh, I was told when I joined the company, and that is think of it like a time microscope. You know, when you look at something that's magnified one-to-one, -one, you see it in a certain way. 
if you magnify that by a factor of 10, you start to see new things. And you maybe start to understand whatever it is that you're looking at better. But you also now see things you'd never seen before that raise new questions. And if you look at something that's magnified by 100, this happens again. And if you look at something that's magnified by 1,000 or 10,000 or a million times, you, start, you, you continue with each magnification to see things you've never seen before and raise as many questions about, well, I wonder what it would look like 10 times more. And that's the way high-speed photography can work as well. Undeniable appeal. While this runs in the background, I'll, I'll talk about some of the things that I create an undeniable appeal. But I think it's already been talked about today, and that is the emotional response to the images. And I think you can be surprised by these images because what you may see is something that you've seen thousands of times before, but when you see it in slow motion, you see it again for the very first time. So the cameras, again, are used in science and in industry for measurements and things like that, but they're also used in, uh, in entertainment. She's probably been hanging there long enough, so let's uh, move on. You saw this image earlier today. Um, Edward Moybridge was hired by a man named Leland Stanford, later to become the governor of California and had a university named after him. He was uh, a horse aficionado, and there was some argument among the equine community in California that time, this is in the 1870s, about whether when a horse was galloping, it flew. Can horses fly? The real question was, is there any point in the gallop where all four hooves of the horse are off of the ground at the same time? And you couldn't tell by watching a horse run. And they tried many times to take still photographs. Well, they didn't take them like this in those days. But they tried many times to take still photographs to resolve this question, and they could never quite catch the moment that would definitively prove whether horses could fly or not. So Edward Moybridge was hired by Leland Stanford to answer this question scientifically. And this is really perhaps the first uh, practical application of high-speed imaging. It took a couple of years to successfully take these shots, which were taken by hitting a tripwire, really a thread, as the horse ran by. The horse ran, runs by at about 40 feet per second. These images that we're looking here were all shot in a little bit less than a second. And uh, he had these 16 cameras set up, each with a tripwire, and you can imagine the triggering was tough because these are cameras from, 19, from the 1870s. But he was finally successful in engineering a solution. And when you knit these together, you can see that, in fact, there is a point in time during a gallop when all hooves are off the ground. And, in fact, horses can fly. Film technology um, developed from about that time forward. And there were three main ways to get high-speed imaging in film. One is called intermittent motion. This is what we're all used to. This is where a, a roll of film is put into a camera. It's engaged and it's pulled down. It's exposed and then the shutter closes and the film moves down, re-registers, shutter opens, it's exposed, etc. And this can happen at up to about 500 frames per second. So uh, a 1,000 foot roll of film is exposed in just a few seconds. It's moving very fast. It's making a lot of noise and, in fact, is somewhat dangerous to be around one of these cameras. Another technology that was developed was the rotating prism technology. This is where the film is no longer registered. It's actually free-flowing through the camera, and there's a prism that has the image coming in, and it's rotating, and then there's usually another set of lenses that focus it on the film. And as the prism rotates, it's rotating relatively at the same speed that the film is moving, and so it then sweeps the image onto the film as it's still moving, and you never have to stop the film. And you can get speeds of thousands, tens of thousands of frames per second using this technology. And finally, the third technology that is used in film is rotating mirror. In this case, you have a roll of film, which may be no more than 100 frames, that's put into an arc inside the camera. And then a mirror is rotating, driven by a motor. And when you're ready to do the shot, you simply open the shutter, and the mirror then sweeps the image across the film. And you now have images. And these cameras can take 
shots at up to millions. Theoretic limit, I think, is 25 million frames per second. Now, the alternate technology is the rotating drum, which is where you put the film in the drum, you spin the drum, and the mirror stays static. In either case, to achieve millions of frames per second here, you have to go to exotic technologies like uh, helium turbines and things like that and talk about getting dangerous. These things do start to get dangerous, and in fact, some of these cameras have to be placed in concrete bunkers. And of course, I think we all know about Doc Edgerton from MIT, the inventor of the flash that we all still use today, uh, a pioneer in stroboscopy. And here is where the contribution was made in the area of being able to freeze something in motion you know, through extremely short exposure times. The film high-speed industry lasted throughout the late 1800s through the 1900s into really 1980 time frame when CCD technology, which had been used in cameras prior, but it began to be used in high-speed imaging. CCD imaging had some problems in terms of its power consumption, image artifacts, and the speed at which you could run it. And so in the 1990s, uh, CMOS was developed. By the way, CCD uh, is, is a semiconductor technology, as is CMOS, complementary metallic oxide semiconductors, or something like that. Anyway, that's the technique that's, or that's the technology that's used in most digital cameras today, CMOS technology. That was developed in the 1990s and really began to be commercialized widely in high-speed cameras in the early 2000s. And what we're striving for with this technology is ever-increasing speed, resolution, light sensitivity, and image quality, and that's where the real pioneering work for us is going forward. Here's a shot. This is a Kingfisher. She shot at about 1,000 frames per second. And, and this is an example of what I'm talking about when you may have seen a bird dive into water and come out before hundreds of times. But when you see it shot at these speeds, you see it like you've never seen it before. Questions come to my mind, like, how did it know the fish was there? You know, it really got it. Uh, how does a bird that's completely submerged under water come out of the water and then have whatever it takes to fly again. You know, I mean, those things start to go through your mind when you see some of this footage. So I think what I want you to watch here is the dog's tongue, right? How many of you have seen a dog drink water? How many of you have always believed, as I did, that when a dog drinks water, it takes its tongue, laps into the water, curls it forward, forms a little cup of water, and pulls that water into its mouth with that cup? wrong. If you watch this, the dog's tongue actually turns backwards and it touches the water and then relies on the surface tension between the tongue and the water to pull the water into the mouth. This is my dog's sailor. <laughs> this was shot by me. So far this is the only thing that was shot by me. You'll have to suffer through a couple of those. You can tell I'm not a professional photographer. This is shot at a thousand frames per second. This clip has exactly, and I'm repeating it, so, so a caution there. This clip has exactly 1,000 frames in it. So the, the actual real time here is one second. So this dog takes three laps of water in one second. And you can't, with your naked eye, see whether that tongue is turned forward or turned backward. And this is part, I think, of the undeniable appeal of high-speed imaging, is you see things you've seen many times before and then you see them in slow motion, and you see them for the first time again. It's like seeing something, again, magnified, and seeing details you've never seen before. All right, let's look at some more things that, you, uh, that I think create an undeniable appeal. One of them is uh, anticipation. Can anyone anticipate what's about to happen here? <laughs> Uh, this is a technique that's often used, you know, in the entertainment business, whether it's TV or motion picture production, slowing down time, uh, giving you some time to savor the inevitable. This car was actually going at 50 miles an hour and crashes into this concrete barrier. Now, I was a little bit disappointed after I included this clip to learn that there was not an airbag in the car because airbags are one of the things that gets studied with these cameras. And an airbag will inflate and deflate shorter than the time it takes you to blink your eye. 
And so a camera like this is essential in the study of these to make sure that they're designed and that they're working properly. Of course, beauty in nature is one of the things that we see because, again, we see natural events in a way that we've never seen them before. That's not extraordinarily high, foot high uh, frame rate footage, but it's still something that would be hard to capture any other way. This is a two-ton great white shark who has been baited to the surface of the ocean near South Africa with a, a rubber seal. Even after all this work, he has to spit it out. Uh, this was shot by a guy laying on a raft, you know, not too far from the shark, and uh, shooting this footage. This all takes place in just about one second. That's a two-ton animal that has just breached that water and is flipping clear over onto its back in an attempt to catch that seal. Okay, here's another one of mine. I love hummingbirds. They're fun to shoot with, with uh, uh, high-speed cameras. These are broad-tailed hummingbirds in Colorado. I took this at my cabin this summer. Uh, it's beautiful footage. All of this happens in about a quarter of a second because those birds flap their wings at 70 times per second. So if you get one second of this footage, you can go in and count, and you can count. It'll be, you know, 69, 71, 72, but about 70 times per second. The cameras are also used in, uh, in scientific discovery. As I said, they're used by scientists and engineers around the world. Uh, this is a technique called Schlieren photography. You familiar with Schlieren photography? Well, Schlieren photography uh, is, uh, is a technique where you actually use a blade shutter to cause light to refract around the blade, and as a result, you can pick up the different densities in gases or waters that you're photographing. So what we're seeing here is a toy helicopter where the rotors have been started up, and then because we're using a Schlieren technology here, or Schlieren technique of photography, you can see the different densities of the air around the helicopter. So this is a technique that can be used in order to study what the turbulence patterns might look like from a, from a toy helicopter, or a real helicopter. This is an, an example of where uh, the cameras are used in product development, although I think this was also used in the product marketing, but this is an electric toothbrush with the drop of water falling on it. I think this is both aesthetically pleasing as well as something that can be used to study how the water you know, reacts to and how the brush handles the water. Golf clubs, golf balls, tennis shoes are all analyzed with these cameras. This is another one of mine. This is actually the very first high-speed shot I got. It, it wasn't the first attempt. It was the first one I was proud of. I think I used up about, I don't know, six or seven hundred kernels of popcorn <laughs> because the darn things want to pop off out of the field of view, you know, and all the interesting stuff is happening out here. So I finally got this shot. I just had a pan, real hot, one drop of oil, popcorn there, waiting with the camera till it popped and then trigger it. And I was uh, very proud of this, so I had to bring it and show it to you. You'll notice I did get a little bit of grease on the lens. You'll, you'll see the, uh, the grease on the lens there. But, uh. And uh, again, I, this one sort of speaks for itself. This was shot by someone obviously in the water with the camera in an underwater housing shooting professional surfers. I'm not sure where this was shot. I think, it, I think it was in Mexico. Seeing something you may have seen before, maybe not quite from this angle, but seeing something you may have seen before, but seeing it again uh, for the first time. So what's next in uh, digital high-speed photography? Well, we're moving to higher and higher resolutions. If you think about it, you know, most of what I showed you there was 1080 HD at the most. Well, that's a two megapixel image, and we take 12 bits per pixel. So you know, that's a lot of data. 
And we're taking those at 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 frames per second. So not only do we have to deal with the, uh, the actual sensor technology to take images that fast, but you have to deal with all of this massive amounts of memory. Our camera that, that we have on the market right now, it's a one megapixel camera, shoots 16,000 frames per second, can fill up 96 gigs of onboard memory in about four seconds. So, so, so there's a lot of technology that we have to work on here to advance higher resolutions. Um, 4K digital cinema is coming. Uh, even 4K in the home may be coming. And once that technology is available, people will be hungry for the content to feed the technology. Higher speeds. And you know, I've had people ask me, well, isn't 1.4 million frames per second enough? <laughs> I mean, the answer is no. Because if you go to 10 million frames per second, you're going to see things you couldn't see at 1.4 million frames per second. Of course, you go that fast, you all know that the maximum exposure is one over the frame rate, so we're talking about needing exposure times or living with exposure times of you know, a few nanoseconds. You know, and that means you're counting photons in that time. And uh, so light becomes an issue, triggering becomes an issue. And of course, ever improving uh, image quality is the other thing that we're working on. I'm a little, I'm at the end of my time. But if I could, I'd like to take three minutes and show you a demo reel from a company called The Marmalade in Germany, who has used our cameras. They're a professional production company. This is their demo reel. And I'd just like to show it to you to kind of illustrate some of these pieces of undeniable appeal that we've talked about. I feel like I want like a frappuccino and some grapes, something like that. Um, Rick, uh, a thousand frames per second HD camera costs about what? So up until 
a few months ago from, from Vision Research, if you wanted a camera that would shoot beautiful color HD video at 1,000 frames per second, you were talking about $125,000 or so. Earlier this year, we did a small form factor HD camera. can shoot up to about 2,500 frames per second. That will run you somewhere around $40,000. Uh, you know, we've seen even in consumer cameras, I think um, Casio mm -hmm. had a number of cameras that could shoot maybe 100 frames per second a few right. years ago or whatnot. Do you think it's sort of inevitable that at a consumer and a prosumer and a, a, a pro DSR level, we'll, we'll see higher frame rates? Yes, I, I think it is inevitable. And because uh, frame rates, both in terms of projection, are going up, um, I think you know the norm used to be 30 frames a second. It'll soon be 60 or 120. So we're already seeing a lot of the professional cameras move up into the higher frame rates. And I think it's a, it's a great space for a prosumer camera. Rick Robinson, everyone. Thank you.